Good morning to you. Mark Sutter with HurricaneTrack.com here. It is now Wednesday, the 12th of July, 2023. And this update, really important today. We've got to discuss that, that background image there, part of the thumbnail for today. That is the Super Blend from Ben Knoll of the UK Met and the European, the ECMWF seasonal guidance, the precipitation anomaly, the dark green. What does all of that mean? As the headline there says, let's discuss this. We'll do that and take a look at some other things going on in the tropics in what I consider to be a pretty important update here because boy the the signs are really starting to be there that we're gonna have a loaded season for the Atlantic Basin that doesn't mean it's a guarantee don't get me wrong I don't know the future but this certainly helps to point the way as to what may be our future as we get to August September and October alright so with that set up let's get started shall we First of all, National Hurricane Center, don't worry about 94L. Chances are diminishing overall. They even mentioned that in the overall outlook, so we're not worried about that too much at all. In the eastern Pacific, hey, we finally got a tropical storm to develop. Calvin out here, and it is expected to become a hurricane, and then eventually reach the cooler, more stable environment. Cooler waters with a stable environment above those waters. In the east central Pacific there, maybe the remnants of it head towards Hawaii, we have many days that we can watch that and see how that evolves. I would be absolutely shocked and stunned if this made it to Hawaii as any kind of a, a viable entity, but you never say never. You never know. Uh, looking at a couple of details related to Calvin, pretty good spin on it overall. Got that sort of wound up shrimp look or a nautilus, whatever you want to call it. Pick the marine animal of your choice. It is curling up there. Uh, trying to develop a core, some dry air, some shear affecting it, uh, but it is doing pretty well compared to 93E, which died away. Back to the overall look here from, and again, I love this dashboard from Dr. Cowan. Uh, this is the spread of the different model guidance, and yes, the spray of it, so to speak, does aim eventually out towards the Hawaiian Islands, but that's many days away, and it'll probably be a remnant circulation by the time it ever even got there. And a quick broader view of satellite imagery for you here. This is the infrared shot. There's Calvin, fairly well developed, more disturbed weather over to the east from where Calvin is. The Gulf of Mexico, plenty clear, and it is really warm in the Gulf. We're going to talk about that. Look, you can even see the warm waters of the Gulf Stream showing up on this infrared satellite imagery. Yes, that's what that is. It's picking up you know, it's infrared as heat or lack thereof. And in this case, the colder cloud tops represented on the legend are higher in the atmosphere, so they're colder, right? But this is water, and that water is very warm. Elsewhere in the tropics, though, not much happening in the Atlantic Basin. Pretty good dust outbreak now. I mean, that's pretty sizable coming off, but it's a little bit farther to the north. We're starting to see that now, so more moisture is going to come off also farther to the north. These dust outbreaks are going to get to be more and more northerly in their extent, opening the door eventually to probably, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking it's just a matter of time now, tropical development through the main development region of the Atlantic. And then we're going to have to really start watching here for our friends in the islands and all the areas west of there towards the greater Antilles and the Bahamas and eventually the southeast United States and elsewhere. I think we're going to have a heck of a season coming up. And I'll show you the evidence of that starting here. Ben Knoll, very popular Hudson Valley guy. Now he's down in New Zealand. He's been on a couple of our documentaries and uh, even live, especially back during the pandemic. We were Zooming with him all the way over in New Zealand. It's amazing what technology has allowed, right? Part of that technology is to be able to look at the different model guidance, these climate models, and they output all kinds of things. And one of them is, of course, a precipitation anomaly. What do the various ensembles and the way that, it, that it's all put together think, if you will? What is their forecast for departures? People want to know, especially in agriculture, different planning purposes, tropical interests like we follow, what are the anomalies, the, the, the departures from the long-term average? And what Ben has come up with is a way to blend these together the UK Met, which has a very aggressive hurricane season forecast, and the ECMWF, which also has an aggressive hurricane season forecast. And we get this, Ben Knowles' 
uh, I won't say patented, but you know, it's just a term. It's patented, um, and it's not patented. Again, it's just a term. Wonderful map here. People have come to know these, and it helps to show the possible precipitation patterns of the upcoming period, August through October. And this really says a lot. So let's break it down. Let's discuss, like I said, in the thumbnail. What does this mean? Well, you know what? Let me help. Let's don't just ignore what Ben said. We'll read his tweet, and then we'll talk about it. We shall discuss. So he starts it off with, wow, the ECMWF UK Met Super Blend for August through October. The heart of hurricane season, it remains very active. It shows above normal rainfall. That's that green color in the eastern and central Atlantic, across the islands, near Florida, and along the southeast U.S. coast. Suggestive, suggestive of the potential for increased tropical storm and hurricane activity. What is the super blend? It's the combination of the ECMWF and UK Met seasonal forecasting systems consisting of about 110 ensemble members. That is very, very important. It's not just saying what does one member or one model say. That would be the equivalent of just getting one person's opinion on something versus another 109 to get a consensus, the ensemble. Now, behavioral science and meteorological ensemble forecasting are not the same thing, but I think that's a good analogy and it helps you to understand. Okay, so 110 ensemble members, wow. They make up the two best seasonal models. That is undisputed. That data can be backed up. If you want to ask Ben or anybody else, hey, we'll prove it, we'll be glad to do so. The, uh, the data gets scrutinized and hindcasted and see how it does. These models do really, really well over time, and they are freely available. That data is freely available depending on your location. All right, so again, that's what he talks about, and this is what it shows a very wet African monsoon, the West African monsoon, that is the source region, at least part of it anyway, for tropical waves. Some of those waves get started over the Ethiopian highlands. That will come out into the Atlantic. We already know how warm the Atlantic is. And then this is what those 110 ensemble members all aggregated together suggest for precipitation anomalies. you got a Bay of Campeche hot spot, so to speak. And then all around here in the vicinity of Florida, the southeast U.S., and then out in the heart of the main development region. Lots of ace points are going to rack up out here. Uh, Spain, Portugal, the UK, Ireland, you name it. Azores, yeah, you might have to uh, uh, deal with hurricanes this year as they come through, especially with how warm the Atlantic is. It could be one heck of a season regardless of the El Nino. And this is really eye-opening. Still holding on to this. This is July that this is put out. This is not April you know, it's not the June when we're just less than a month away from August, obviously. I mean, two weeks away, two plus weeks. Come on. And a month from now, the Cape Verde season will be just about ready to start in terms of climatology. All right. So to me, an important, eye-opening, almost jarring reminder, you know, very seriously here, that we could have an extremely active season but it doesn't mean that it must happen. This is not a guarantee. There are still instances, it's all probability, right, where very little could happen. But this is highly suggestive. 110 ensemble members, and this is what you got? Wow, that is pretty impressive. And this is a big culprit as to why I'll, I'm only going to show it briefly. We've seen it so many times. The El Nino is just not that much overall versus all of this gargantuan warmth that dwarfs what's going on with the El Nino. It really does. The overall amount of warmth, all of this is one degree Celsius plus higher than the 30-year average. And then it's very warm relative to average in the far northeast Atlantic. And that's what I'm talking about. These hurricanes could come off and they can form and then you get this big trough out here. They could recurve, come through the Azores. And it is possible, I would think, that our friends up there in Ireland, the UK, and even Spain and Portugal could get some of these even late in the season because this water is going to take a while to come down off of these remarkable anomalous high temperatures. Speaking of anomalous warmth, I just, I can't believe this. I got a couple of uh, messages from people that I know along the Gulf Coast in, the, in recent days about how brutally warm the nighttime temperatures are 
and we've seen the tweets from people talking about, look, are these errors that we're seeing from some of these gauges, 95, 97 degrees at some of, and I know the water's shallow, relatively speaking, down in the Keys and in the Florida Bay area, but I mean, come on. Upper 90s for water temperatures, it's not good. It is not good on so many levels. The humidity, the added upper ocean heat content, even though there's not a lot of it because it is shallower water, it still evaporates all this moisture. That feeds bigger rainfall totals for even slow-moving tropical storms. And if you get the atmosphere to cooperate, you could have some very intense hurricanes feeding off of that water. But I like to temper that and make sure you understand you can also get a very intense hurricane with 80 or 81 degree water, like Michael in 2018. The atmosphere lined up just right on October 10th, and Michael was a Category 5 up there in Mexico Beach. But it certainly helps when water temperatures are this ridiculously warm, 31, 32 Celsius, uh, and this is a lower resolution. When you really zoom in and look at the high-res data, local buoy information, I have never seen it this warm. And I've done this a long time. We can go back and look at the archives. A lot of different climate scientists, oceanographers, they are stunned. They really are. This is, it's bad for the corals. It's got to be bad for marine life overall. You know, I'm not an expert in that field, but that's too warm. It really is. The Atlantic, we expand out. I mean, just look at this. All around the Bahamas, 30, 31 Celsius. I mean, ridiculous. There's a 32 Celsius isotherm right there. I mean, I'm just saying, you, you get a hurricane to come through, uh, you know it could happen. Something that tracks through like this, I mean, and that would escape a lot of the effects of El Nino. El Nino is mostly going to affect the Caribbean. Once you get north of about 20 degrees latitude, 25, you know, stretching it there, that get into the subtropics, out of the effects of El Nino, it could just go bonkers. It, it started to concern me, and you don't hear that from my voice very often. I try to play it pretty even. We talk about facts. We don't hype stuff up. But these surface temperatures, the upper ocean heat content, that's also there. It's as important not just to look at the skin, right? you got to look beneath. And yes, the upper ocean heat content, that is to say how deep that warm water is. Most of the Gulf is fairly shallow, yes. But a lot of the vast areas of the Atlantic, that upper ocean heat content is very deep into the, uh, the Atlantic, all right? And then off of my neck of the woods over here, uh, I live in Wilmington, North Carolina. Let's just look over here. We're talking 28 degrees Celsius right up against the coast. I was down at Wrightsville Beach yesterday with the family, and yeah, it's nice and toasty. Not record warmth here yet, thank goodness. We actually set a record back in 2018. I think the water temperature, very shallow there, right at the shelf at Johnny Mercer's Pier at Wrightsville Beach. If I'm not mistaken, I think we hit 89 degrees one day. It was just an anomaly, a freak event. But the, uh, the water temperature is even off the southeast coast, very warm, and it's only mid-July. All right, this just continues to blow my mind. SOI, back up today, 5.23, the 30-day average, gained a little bit, back up to 2.23. As I've said, until I see this go off a cliff, we're not going to get those westerly winds to restart the conveyor belt. And guess what? The Havmolar diagrams are responding Easterly winds all projected by the GFS. Even some of the other modeling is starting to see this now. And this is later in the month of July to close out July. Are you kidding me? Wow. And then we have a return to some westerly wind flow. A little bit of an uptick in trades here. But as we get through the rest of July, the trade's not very strong across the Atlantic. And that would help to keep things nice and warm maybe even helping to start to spawn some tropical activity as low-level westerlies help to induce a little bit of spin or cyclogenesis sometimes. That's a story for another day. All in all, a very favorable look coming up for August, September, probably into October as the El Nino doesn't look like it's going to come in in time to bail us out. Does this verify? We'll see. And the other thing that Ben does, and we'll do this in November, it may be painful to see, true, but he's going to overlay the tracks of what actually happened, and we'll get to see how the models performed. Remember, this is a generalization of 110 of the ensemble members. It's not necessarily exactly what is going to happen, all right? So there you go. Pretty somber update today, but it is what it is. We have to be ready. We have to use this knowledge ahead of time, 
and make sure we are prepared to the best of our individual abilities. All right, I'm going to be traveling starting tomorrow for a couple of days going up to the northeast. Something exciting is coming to Hurricane Track. I will tell you all about that next week, and it begins with a trip. I'll give you a small hint. I'm heading up to Rhode Island. What in the world could I possibly be doing there? Well, tune in Monday, and you'll find out. So between now and then, have a great few days off from, I don't want to say listening to me, but you'll get a few days off from me because I'm going to be pretty busy. And I'll be back Monday. We'll do a big update, and I'll tell you all about what I got cooking up from my trip up to Rhode Island. I'm Mark Suddeth. As always, thanks for tuning in. I'll talk to you again on Monday.